Good morning, Covenant. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, how's everybody doing this morning? Come on, let's, uh, let's stand up and worship. Father, I oh, thank you for this time. What a, what a great time and privilege it is to come together to sing your praises, to celebrate you. You are an amazing God, and I thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. The big things, the little things, Lord, you are so good. You are so good. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love.
Doesn't make sense. We'll never come. 
doesn't make sense, we'll never comprehend the way you love us. It's unthinkable. Only heaven knows just how far you go to say. Lord Jesus, we gather this morning just so overwhelmed by the reality that you love us so much. As we come to worship this morning, Lord, and we gather in this place, we thank you for that extravagant love. We thank you that you are the God who reaches down to each of us and meets us just where we most need you. Lord, whether we are in this place, physically in this place, or we're watching this by live stream, each of us comes to this morning bringing the past week with us. So we ask right now that the Holy Spirit would just fill us, that you would remind us, you would call us to remember that you are in it all, Whatever happened this last week, whatever is going to happen next week, from, from the joy of answered prayer to the sadness of the cries of a loved one in turmoil. Lord, wherever we find ourselves in that continuum, you are there with us because of that extravagant love. So we ask now, that in this moment you would help us to just put aside the things of this life that might keep us from being in this place, stationary and focused on what you might say to us. Lord, in the next few minutes, would you allow us to just leave those things at the foot of the cross? In this technology-driven world that it's so hard to disconnect, Help us to just stop, to breathe, and to come to you. Lord, in the stillness, in the silence, we desire to hear your voice. Speak to us. Look into every nook and cranny of our lives. Find if there's anything in there that grieves your heart and begin to call us back to you. Encourage us to be open, authentic, honest as we allow your spirit to minister to our hearts, to our minds, to our thoughts. And what we want out of that, Lord, is that you would then call us into service, to go into all the world and to tell the world that Jesus Christ makes a difference in everything that we do. So call us to action, Lord, every moment of every day in every way. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mary Elzinga, and I'm Director of Women's Ministries here at Covenant. It's my joy to welcome you to worship on this liquid, sunshiny day. So would you just turn and welcome someone else that's around you to worship? Well, the light is reflecting in my eyes, so you all look stunning. <laughs> that could be truth. It could be fiction. I'm not sure. But welcome again to worship. If this is your first time here with us at Covenant, 
a very special welcome. We would encourage you to grab any one of us if you have questions or want to get a little bit more connected. And please be sure and stop at the, uh, at the information center and pick up a gift that we have waiting for you. In the seat pocket in front of you, you'll see some connect cards. And that is our invitation for you to share with us. It could be a prayer request. It could be an answer to prayer. Um, it could just be information that you want us to be aware of. So we welcome any and all of you to feel free to document it on that and put it in the offering plate or um, drop it off at the information center. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would go ahead and come forward to receive our gifts and offerings. And um, this past week, I was reminded in a couple different ways how uh, your gifts and offerings make a difference in the lives of others. And I just want to share with you three little snippets that I got in my email. First one from someone who is receiving care from a Stevens minister. To walk with this person through one of the most difficult situations our family has ever had to face has made a tremendous difference in my life. Thank you for providing that care. Another one. We've been transformed by your addiction support groups that you have here at Covenant. In them, we have found a safe place to be honest and real with the hard things in our lives. And the last one, from a parent of a um, Shape Adventure Week child. I've been blown away by what has happened at Shape Adventure Week this week. And guess what? It's only Tuesday. The kids are having a blast. They come home singing songs and telling us about their day and so very excited to learn about Jesus Everything is done so well and so organized, and the volunteers are such a delight. What an awesome experience we're having at this church. We love it more and more each day. I, that's just a little reflection of what your gifts do to bring ministry to our community. So thank you on behalf of all the people whose lives are touched by your generosity. Would you just watch the screen and see what else is happening this week? Welcome to Covenant. I'm Sarah, and let's check out some of the things we have going on. If you're new to Covenant and haven't had a chance to introduce yourself, we want to invite you to our connecting point. This is a day where you can meet our lead pastor, staff, and others who are new to Covenant. That'll be Sunday, August 5th at 3 p.m. in the cafe. Coming up on August 4th and 5th is a great weekend for you to join us at Covenant. We will be celebrating our lasting change baptism services. Come and hear the stories about how God is changing the hearts and lives of people in our community. Please continue to pray for our student summer missions team serving right now in South Philadelphia and to London, England. For information about these events and others, please visit our website at covenantdoylestown.org. So indeed, the teams are off overseas and in Philly doing their work, but um, one announcement I want to be sure that you don't miss or overlook is next week's Sunday, we will be bidding farewell to Pastor John Marcotte. Um, he's certainly my friend and has been my partner in ministry um, because he does men's and I do women's, so we, we, we fight a lot. <laughs> um, but he's just been a joy and has brought such love and dedication and has been such a servant of Christ in this place. So we would encourage you to come be a part of that um, farewell next week between the, the three different services. Um, and to just show your expression of what his ministry here has meant to your life, both now and future. So as we continue to worship this extravagant God, would you stand and join us in singing? Ding. 
Father, you are life. Praise his name. He is so good. Thank you, Father, for this time of worship, that we can come and get re-centered with you, Lord. I thank you for everyone in this room, and I thank you for all the hearts that you've brought here today, Lord. I thank you that we can come with our baggage and, and the pain of this world, Lord, and we can lay it at your feet, at the foot of the cross. And we get to pick up your love, your life, your peace, your hope, your joy. Everything that we long for and seek, Lord, we can find in you. And I thank you for that. That is amazing. As Bob comes up to speak, Lord, I pray that what he says really digs deep into our heart. And it doesn't just stay there, but it spreads throughout our body. And as we leave, it continues to spread and grow, Lord. And then we can spread, spread it to other people. Thank you for that. I thank you for Bob, and I thank you for this awesome team. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for those truths of living the light of our Savior, and uh, that is really uh, what our time of corporate worship is about, it's to arming us with the words and content that then frame our heart and life for the future ahead. So uh, just one thing before we dig in, uh, we had a pre-construction meeting on Monday. It went great. So pretty soon you're going to be seeing some dirt move, and uh, God's timing is such that uh, please keep that in prayer because then you, you know, dirt moves in August, then construction materials, September, October, November, we want to get it under roof so that they can work all winter on it. So uh, that's the task rep, but praise God. Thank you for praying. Thank you for all those who are uh, engaging with us in this great expansion project. So well, we're in this series called Breathe, and Breathe's tagline is to live with Christ as we live for Christ. And they're the means by which we can individually connect with Christ so that as we live out that life, we're not just doing things detached from him. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, we can't do anything in communion with Christ. We can't be Christ-like apart from relying upon him. And so this series addresses really our need to not be so consumed with doing the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. That we're not so busy serving that we don't sit at his feet and, and really spend time with him. And so each week we give you a bookmark. You can, I hope you're collecting those and setting those apart. Uh, collect and trade with friends. But they really bring to you kind of a, a tapestry of the different balances and rhythms of our spiritual life. So we look the first week just by review uh, at our need to take in the word of God. And from Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. It revives the soul. The statutes of the Lord are right. They bring joy to the heart. As we spend time in the word, we experience the fear of God, which is clean. So if you need, if you need life, if you need joy, if you want the uplift of purity that endures, then you need to spend time in the word of God. And, and then the, the next week we looked at prayer which is coming before God as we are. And so we looked at Psalm 62 about, in silence, my soul waits for you, O God. You are my refuge. And so just being able to come before God and quiet the other things, but then also he says, pour out your heart. And God wants us to just sometimes crawl up into our Father's lap and pour out our heart. That's, that's the essence of prayer and communion with God. And then we looked at meditation. Meditation is kind of a hybrid between reading the word and praying. And we looked at Psalm 119, your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it's where the content of the word in our mind drops to our heart. And we pray and dialogue and digest the word of God. It means we're slowing down and taking in. Then we looked at praise from Psalm 145. And uh, that God is great and greatly to be praised. And on the splendor of his majesty, majesty we meditate, but also we declare uh, and so praise is, again, that focus outside of ourselves uh, to God himself, and then verbally taking hold of who God is. 
Then let me look at fasting. And fasting is really recognizing we shouldn't just squeeze God into an already crammed life, but sometimes we've got to give something up. And so even food, all the time that we spend shopping, preparing, cleaning up. So just simplifying. It might be a day of going without food. It might be a meal, or it might just be simplifying. Say, I'm going to just eat pre made ready things and just devote the rest of that time to God. It's opening up ways to, by subtraction, bring God to the center of your life. And then we looked at the corollary of that, of feasting last week. And feasting is taking some of the ordinary good gifts of God and making sure that we don't just, in a sense, terminate on the experience of the gift, but that we take the gift like a shaft of light and we trace the light back to the one who gave it, the Father of lights. And so feasting. So all of those things from reading the word, praying, meditating on the word, so it drops into our heart, praising God, removing things from our life to make room for God, and then taking the ordinary things of, of God and feasting on them and tracing the delight back to him. And this morning, we look at solitude. Uh, and solitude is part of, uh, with all of these, none of these will work without some time to draw and come apart in solitude. Uh, and I want you, uh, we're going to look at several scriptures, but a, a central one that I want you to see makes my first point, and that is that solitude is something that God wants for us, not simply a duty that God wants from us. And we find this as something that God pursues for us. He wants it for us more than we want it for ourselves. And solitude is, again, um, seen in Mark chapter 6. Jesus had just gotten the devastating news that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed in a violent way by Herod. And he says in verse 30 to his disciples, Mark 6, 30, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus and they were telling him everything they had done and taught. I love that verse, by the way. <laughs> when we're doing things for Jesus, we need to then stop and come to Jesus and say, Jesus, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm teaching. Not that Jesus needs the information, but we need to process what we're doing and teaching with him. And then Jesus says, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And Jesus wanted them to experience solitude. So he described the place, desolate, no, no distractions, and, and a place of rest. Uh, and to come, up, to come aside so that they don't fall apart, really, is what Jesus is about here. And this is really the essence of what it means to experience solitude. Now, if you do that, if you come away to a solitude, a desolate place where you're unplugged, whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll experience solitude. <laughs> solitude can sometimes, because our hearts continue to race and, and such, because it's a state of heart. It's not just a state of place. And so sometimes our hearts have got to deal and grapple to come to that place of peace. But it was Archbishop William Temple who said this. He said, your, your spirituality, or your, he says your religion, he means spirituality by that, is what you do with your solitude. In other words, the way you find out where, how you're really functioning in life uh, is, and what your ultimate concern is, is when you're alone and you have nothing to do and no other agenda, what do you think about? One writer said it's, it's a scary thing. And this was a, uh, over a century ago. So it's a scary thing for people to actually get alone with themselves. <laughs> and so we find all kinds of reasons to not actually ever silence and quiet the other voices. But solitude and silence are gifts God wants for us. We see it in the prophets. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And we see it in beloved Psalm 23 which says, the Lord is my shepherd. That's a really intimate one-on-one -on -one walk with God. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And then it says, he restores my soul. So there's something in that quiet. Uh, I like the way Eugene Peterson translates this. He says, you have bedded me down in lush meadows and you find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath, and you send me in the right direction. And so it's that kind of, that kind of gift of aloneness that God fills. And so solitude, again, it can, it can make us very uncomfortable. I love the uh, Mr. Rogers movie that has come out. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but there's a, a section of that where he takes children and just says, children, we're going to experience what one minute is. And it's actually, he just, this was on TV. He broke all the rules 
but just like for a minute, nothing. And they were just mesmerized. You just see, and you, you wonder like, what's happened to our culture that that is even harder? It's a lot harder to envision that happening now than it was back when he was uh, in his prime. Uh, and, and so solitude is this, is this a gift, and we find God pursuing it. I could give you many examples. I just want to summarize a few. One is uh, the prophet Elijah. After an incredibly intense and confrontational season where he had to confront the false prophets, there was a public confrontation, a contest where a literal fire was sent from heaven to consume the altar. And, and after that, he was so spent that he entered into a season of fitful self-pity. Some said even even to the point of suicide, because he said, I, Lord, I alone am left. He starts out by saying, Lord, it is enough. I didn't offend God that he said that. That was just him being real with God. He said, it is enough. Uh, and, and then he says, I alone am I'm left. And so he went on a day's journey and sat down under a broom tree, and then God gave him a meal that sustained him for a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb. And then he's at Mount Horeb, and God has him all alone. And God displays his grandeur before him. He sends, first of all, a wind. And this wind was like no other tornado. It tore the face off of mountains and rocks. I, from the Midwest, I actually experienced and seen the devastation of tornadoes afterward, but I've never seen a tornado that like tore the face off of mountains. And then God sent an earthquake. And then God sent a fire. But the next thing it says is then God spoke to him in a, st I love the King James Version, it says a still small voice or the sound of a quiet whisper. Or, or as one translator, I think, really captured it, said the sound of sheer silence. And it was that that drew Elijah out of the cave. And it was, it was that that ministered to his spirit and gave him what he needed for the next part of his path. And you see, this, this is something that God wants for us. It's, it's the access we have before God. You know, God is... God is in no need of rest or solitude in this way. God doesn't have to fluctuate from community to being solitude, right? Because God is Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is always in perfect, overflowing, loving community. And at the same time, he stands in the solitude of the majesty of his being, one God in three persons. But we, we are not like that. And so we have got to detach from these things. And God wants us to because he knows we can't function without detachment. And so, again, there's no better example than Jesus. He rose early, Mark chapter 135. He rose early in the morning while it was still dark. And he didn't invite his disciples to go with him. Um, and he went outside to a desolate place, is what Mark said. And there he prayed. Uh, in Luke 6, 12, it says he went out to the mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. And in Matthew 14, 23, in the midst of a day, it says he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone for a sustained season of time. And so if Jesus himself did this to connect with God and Jesus, perfect. He doesn't have the sin dwelling in his heart to sabotage him, to cloud his vision. If he needed these times, you know, I, I like what Dallas Willard said. He said, if Jesus needed 40 days alone in the wilderness to begin his ministry, maybe I could use a day or two. <laughs> that really has, has helped me to conceptualize it. Uh, and, and we need it, in a sense, we need that rhythm even every single day. There need to be points and pivot points where we detach. And God has built a couple of them into our lives. One is when we wake up in the morning. We don't have to begin... Abruptly, we can, we can begin with God. I was talking to someone last night. They said that's their practice. They, they wait just a little longer, um, and then they rise. They commune with God first. Or at the end of a day, they say, I don't fall asleep like that. Some of us do, but if, if you don't fall asleep like that, that's a gift. And in the midst of the stillness and darkness, to commune with God. Uh, and so God wants this, again, for us so that we can function the way we're, we're meant to. And the second point is this, and this, there's only two points this morning, and that is you, can, you and I cannot connect well without detaching. We cannot connect well without detaching. And that means not only to God, but that means to other people. Thomas Merton was a, a monk. He went into the Trappist Monastery uh, of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And, and he wrote a book about uh, this silence and coming apart and the things that he learned. And one of the things he wrote is he says that if you were only coming apart to escape the hustle and bustle of life, 
Then he, and then he, he says basically this. This is a paraphrase of Scripture. He says, but, says, then you deserve to be in a company of misanthropes, cranks, and curmudgeons who all are just trying to escape the hustle and bustle. But he says, if you come apart to recognize it, you've got to come apart in, in order to reconnect, then, then it's filled with a kind of love and mission. Um, Henry Nouwen, who is an author I really respect, he said this, he says, when we, when we ask ourselves which p- people in our lives mean the most to us, we often find that those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, but have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand, the friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not pressing, not curing, not healing, and just face us with the reality of our powerless in the silence. A friend who can sit with us like that, that is really a friend who cares. That is a, a precious gift. And so this kind of coming apart, it breaks our speaking to others. There's not even the pressure of having to speak with God. When I've set times of extended silence, one of the things I've learned is just, just the gift of that quietness. Because sometimes what intrudes upon us in our relationship with God is what intrudes upon us in conversations. There are many conversations that are not really conversations. They're just people taking turns talking, right? And we sometimes fall prey to that, right? Someone is talking, and we're thinking about what we're going to say. Maybe it's because we're intimidated, or it's a difficult situation, or maybe it's just become a default. And so they share their experience, and before we really process, ask a question, probe a little deeper to what that felt like, how they're doing, we should, oh, I had the same thing, this, right? (laughs) I've sometimes seen it with people who face severe trials, and somebody has a fresh, raw trial, and so they share that with someone, and before they can really process it, the other person is just, they're saying, oh yeah, I, 1982, I had the same thing. They're like, it, that's not a conversation, right? It's taking turns talking. Uh, and, and so in the gift of silence before God, getting alone with God can help you disconnect so that then you can reconnect. And, and it will make us better at loving the people who are in our life. Now, look, it's true that the people in our life get to give us input on how well we're doing loving them, right? You can't just go along and say, well, God's told me how I'm to love you, and this is it, right? But it's also true that God needs to weigh in. How are we doing in loving the people who are in our life? And this week, I, I came upon someone who writes well on marriage, and They wrote about the fact that without solitude, you cannot be the spouse that God wants you to be. And here's what they say. They say, the point of marriage is not to create a quick commonality by tearing down all the boundaries. On the contrary, they say, a good marriage is one in which each partner appoints the other to be the guardian guardian of their solitude, and thus they show each other the greatest possible trust. Because in marriage, a merging of two people into one is an impossibility where it seems to exist. It's a hemming in. Uh, It's a mutual consent. If you try to just press and say you're never, ever separate, it's a mutual consent that will rob one another or both parties of their fullest freedom and development. But once the realization is accepted that even between the closest people, there is a distance that exists, a marvelous living side by side can grow up for them if they succeed in loving the expanse between them and they are enabled to see each other as whole. I, I found that to be true. Sometimes in, in reconnecting, in just asking God, how am I loving the people in my life? That time, that space, that white space and margin allow me to reconnect with greater insight. And so, so again, you've got to come apart or you'll fall apart in your relational life. Um, secondly, second implication of that is to experience solitude, you've got to truly unplug. Uh, It's not solitude if there is the constant steady stream of input going on around you. It's just like, I know some people who live alone and there is the constant steady stream of the background of television noise. And they say, oh, I'm not watching any of that. But it it is constantly um, assaulting them. It's, It's problematic. It's not helpful to solitude to have incessant noise on in the background. Uh, One of the best things we did is we don't have cable TV. So I haven't had cable news for three years. I don't miss it. (laughs) And if there's anything that rivals cable news, uh, it's talk sports radio. If there is a toxic, self-righteous thing that could compete with cable news, it's sports radio, at least in Philadelphia, right? Turn it off. Quiet it down. Um, 
I discovered that I can kill all the notifications on my phone. You know how your phone it vibrates, you get something? But I've been around people who like, their phone vibrates because something happened in the sports world. Or their phone vibrated because something happens, you know, in some other media that they're connected to. And their phone is just always vibrating. I mean, I don't know how they, I couldn't live that way. And I've learned like, I can kill virtually all the notifications. I can even, uh, at times when I go away in solitude, I can kill everybody's notification except my wife so that I can just check that and nothing else. But we need to detach ourselves from this incessant engagement. And I know, I was talking to a young mom recently, and she's like, you know, you talk about solitude. I just wish I could have six minutes to get a shower. I've got three kids who are, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're, well, you're going to need to experience the blessing of community and, and ask for that space. You need it to survive. You need that space to survive. And there's just this proper rhythm. So, so we've got to unplug for it. And third, what it allows is when, when we do this, we will be getting our input from God in a first-hand way, not a second-hand way. So important that, that we do get our input from God in a first-hand, not a second-hand way. And that means we may be taking... Christian books and sermons and messages and Bible studies we're in, but that then we're processing them before God. Because what can happen to us is we're like someone, if you've, have you ever sat watching television and someone wants to watch two sporting events and they, then they have the remote control and you don't. And you only really care about one of them or you're only tuned into one of the TV shows and they're moving back and forth, flipping back and forth. And you think, like, I wish we could just focus. And at some point you may even say, I, I would even be content now to focus on the one I'm not even interested in. I'm just so tired of this flipping back and forth, flipping back and forth. And there, there is a gift of that sustained time. I mean, so we find it with Moses, right? Before, after he was in Pharaoh's house, he left for 40 years. He was in the desert <laughs> before he was called to go lead them back. Uh, we find when the apostle Paul experienced Christ on Damascus Road, he says that I didn't consult with any man, and he was for three years alone with Christ so that he could process that. And, and here's what I've found. If I don't pray and process what I'm seeking to convey and what God is calling me to do, then I can be very unsure about it. Not even necessarily to the point of not doing it, but just to the point where there's a disquiet. And there's such a benefit to getting before God and having this sense that he has affirmed what we've received from him. Um, so we find this in the Bible again and again, that um, we've got to ourselves have a firsthand, not a hand-me-down relationship with God. And, and that we let him speak directly. And, and here's what will happen. When we practice solitude well, it breaks the power of our busyness our sense of hurry, our isolation, and solitude even has the power to break our loneliness. Solitude and loneliness are not the same thing. Loneliness is really the, the fallen aspect of that. Solitude is filling our life with God. I remember talking to someone who had a really intimate marriage. It was my, my Aunt Lucy, really intimate marriage with a wonderful husband, and uh, after he died, uh, I just stumbled recently upon a note from her, and she says, I really miss my husband, Garvey. And I live alone, but he says, but I am never really alone because Christ is with me. And then she wrote this, she says, and I love him so. And I was like, she got it. I'm alone, but I'm not really alone. And I love him so. I love the one who discloses himself to me in this way. And so silence again, unplugging, getting to a desolate place where there's not those distractions, far from being an absence it allows the reality of God to stand in the midst of where we're living. And it provides that sustenance for us so that we can attend upon who he is. And so here's, here's our quick assignment. And we're going to spend time in the Lord's Supper to give us an opportunity to, to practice this. As a, but this week, identify the place, the time, and the ways you'll experience solitude. There really needs to be a daily rhythm for this. But sometimes what I have found is when I give some extended period of time and I had to get over the sense of feeling like it was selfish, okay? So maybe some of us have to get over that. 
Just like it is not selfish for a lifeguard to stay in shape and keep swimming and get off their chair and so that they can do their job, they've got to invest in their own physique. It's, it's not selfish for us to invest in our own tranquility and serenity and sense of peace. It is not selfish. It is one of the most selfless things we can do. And so we've got to find that place, time, and way that we will let God fill and connect with our life, where we're accessible to no one but God. Um, and where we can recharge and replenish. And then we've got to ask God to amplify our awareness and interaction with him and let him fill those spaces. And there's, there's great benefit sometimes to just sitting down and saying, you know, Christ, I've been in your word here. I've heard these sermons. I've been in this Bible study. I, I know these things. And, and there's a richness over the seasons of life where you just say, and Christ, what would you really want to say to me right now? with an open Bible and an open heart and a, an open life before him. And to lay before Christ and say, hey, would you evaluate my work-life balance? <laughs> would you evaluate just the whole balance of, of my life and be speaking into that? <laughs> because it's not only our ability to understand other people, but, but to understand ourselves, we have got to uh, allow this, this kind of input. And so we now have an opportunity in the Lord's Supper to do this. And and in connection with solitude, when the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, comes to Christ instituting the Lord's Supper, one thing that happens in the Gospels, and that is all of a sudden, the spotlight particularly falls upon Christ and all the other supports are taken away from him. He is so alone as he goes to the cross. His disciples have left him and all this. And he is going to experience the march to the cross in solitude, but in communion with God. In fact, his communion with God is so strong that in the seven words that he prays from the cross, the seven phrases that he prays, they're just, they're virtually all of them quotes from scriptures and amplification of scripture. But as he goes there, he is going to experience an isolation from God. Some say the Trinity was almost divided. I don't think it, it was that radical because he's praying, my God, in his darkest hour, he prays, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he's still holding on to God. But he's enduring our, our guilt, the isolation caused by our own sin, and he is carrying that for us so that he could bear it. And here's the reality. He did this, and he experienced that kind of solitude and aloneness he took on our guilt without himself becoming guilty. He took on our sin without himself becoming a sinner. He took on our shame without himself experiencing shame. And he bore the guilt and he felt it more than we could ever feel it because he had never felt anything like that before in his own presence. So that now when we come before God in our solitude, in our silence, we experience a God who never turns his back to us but who is always accessible to us before God and that we can come boldly into that holy place and lay ourselves out before the God who already knows us in depth. And so the Lord's Supper is about our freedom of access to do that and the fact that God's affections are already upon us. There's nothing good we can do that we need to do to make him love us more. There's nothing bad we can do that would turn his love away from us if we cling to to the one who established this communion with him. And so if you're in Christ Jesus, as you partake of this, these sacred signs and symbols of what broke down the barriers so that you never are really isolated and alone when you're alone with God, but that his face is toward you, let's just take this and make those moments, the beginning of our pursuit, our connection, our recharging, our reinvigoration through the presence of God. He bore our guilt so that we no longer are separated in our guilt and we can experience his embrace and love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gift. You know our frame. Your word says you know our frame, that we are but dust. You know how much we need you. And so we pray that you would take this time of communing with you and that you would implant in us a fresh sense of your love. We thank you that your love is eager to rest upon us. Indeed, your heart is restless until we know that we are your beloved through Christ. And so commune with us. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and confirm your presence and your promises to us through this visible word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So our servers come forward. Again, this is for those who have rested their hope and faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to us what this means as he took the bread and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many.
your love is so much stronger than anything I faced and I want to know your heart I want to know your heart I love those words the love of God is sweeter than anything we taste it is stronger than anything we face from your prayers who'd love to pray for you if there's something you're facing and you need that extra strength and assurance they'd love to pray for you about that or anything else i'm going to pronounce this blessing on you from ephesians chapter one so lift up your hearts open your hearts and receive this from god the scriptures from paul says he says i keep on praying that the god of our lord jesus christ the glorious father would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.